a world craving connection, our live stream worship community bridges the gap between isolation and fellowship. We gather to hold on to Jesus through the week rather than only on a Sunday. Jesus urged us to engage with the world. We've created a digital sanctuary where privacy is respected, hearts are open, and we celebrate the work of God's Holy Spirit, strengthening us and empowering us to serve. This is where we acknowledge life's precious moments, from the monumental to the mundane and the presence of God in all things. And yet, as disciples, we hope to shine as beacons of hope to encourage those who are questioning the difference that faith can make to their lives. So join us, contribute your stories, and come close. Help us to continue building that sense of belonging that echoes through our community. Your voice can be the next thread in the tapestry of our collective spiritual journey. Good morning, folks. Just think, where, where's my camera gone? I've lost my camera. I lost my camera, folks. Welcome and lovely to see you. Welcome, especially if you are watching on Sunday morning, because as we move forward, what we're going to do is as we join on a Thursday with our usual crowd for morning prayers, we are going to be recording the entry and some of the early reflections that we'll use on Sunday. And I hope in doing that, uh, we give you, if you're there on a Sunday, a sense of being part of the live stream community during the week and our thoughts and prayers with you if you cannot make it on a Sunday because, of course, you're unwell, caring for others or working shift patterns. Uh, you're very much in our thoughts and prayers. But broadly, looking through and tying up everything for the week, where are we? Well, let's just have a look at the Methodist Church website. One or two changes there. So firstly, a reminder that we've got Unbounded Love. If you haven't signed up, uh, please, I'd encourage you to do so. But we will be following these reflections. They are Lenten reflections uh, for this uh, year. Uh, God's love doesn't stay in the lines. Israel-Palestine remains there, you can see, as a focus for our prayers. But two significant additions to the site a statement of support for King Charles after the announcement of his cancer diagnosis and a reminder that it was World Cancer Day earlier uh, to earlier this uh, week. And so indeed there is the link to that. And it's the focus is on the role of chaplains bringing comfort to hospice patients and their families. Released on the second but really helpful article there to lead us into worship. What else do we have? Well, as you know, during the week... Um, I really hope that this helps folks to gain a grasp of what's happening as we journey towards Sunday, particularly for preparing for worship. Um, but every day on, uh, we, we revisit what the readings are, but focus on one of them. And so 2 Kings 2, 1 to 12, Elijah is, uh, ascends to heaven, is taken up to heaven. And the mantle of leadership is, is handed over to Elisha and a tender story there of uh, Elisha having to accept that uh, Elijah is going to have to go. Almost says, as we looked at this, I think, yesterday, or so, so, so I'll, um, don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it effectively. <laughs> I'll, I'll, please, you know, and everyone's saying, you do know uh, Elijah's going to go. So a tender story there of change and new beginnings. We're going to focus and major on Psalm 50 for our introduction today because we have um, Simon and Helen offering our readings on Sunday, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 6, as we'll hear from that if we're listening on a Sunday. Uh, uh, Paul underlines once again his purpose in preaching the gospel and it not being about him, being about Christ and about how... Um, Folks, sometimes they just seem blinded to receive the gospel, to, to receive the truth. and uh, But Christ is able to break through that darkness. And Mark 9, 2 to 9, it's the transfiguration. I know Stephen will be sharing on that on Sunday. But Mark, Psalm 50, 1 to 6, I thought would be helpful for us as we enter into our worship this morning. So uh, here we are. It's called the Acceptable Sacrifice. And as we gather here... Uh, whether we're gathering Thursday or on a Sunday, um, the question is, you know, why are we gathering? We gather to remember that God is at the centre of our lives, uh, I hope. Um, but also we offer something of ourselves. We all do that, whether we are offering a reading, uh, whether you're like me, are presenting worship, whether we are bringing ourselves to worship. We offer ourselves um, in worship. And the word sacrifice appears 
within many of our liturgies, but it's a bit of an ancient word, and it feels like a bit of a gory word as well, doesn't it? Um, but ultimately, you know, sacrifice is about offering something of ourselves. It's about offering something that costs us, uh, and we do that because we're demonstrating to God God's value. But there's more to it than that. Firstly, everything that we give comes from God in the first place. Our very lives come from God in the first place, and so we give back to God. And also our sacrifice, it's not just about our lives, well, or interpolated from that, it's about the time that we have, it's about the gifts that we bring. But it's a good question. What is an acceptable sacrifice? Let's make sure our sacrifice of worship and praise, in particular, is uh, honours God today. So the psalm reads, and this is just the first uh, few um, verses here, the first six verses, um, God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of its sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is judge. So yes, be encouraged uh, today as we gather for worship. Let's pray, and we'll pray before God with uh, a prayer that acknowledges God at the centre of our lives, but we'll also come before God in a prayer of confession as we gather. But wherever you are, whether you're Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, um, make sure you pop in the prayer requests, uh, any particular prayers that you uh, might have. So, Lord, we acknowledge you, uh, almighty, at the core of everything that we do, at the core of life and uh, in a world where we at times um, seem to think that we are the masters of our own ends. We acknowledge that you, in fact, are the one who is almighty creator. So whatever it is that we are coming with that's preoccupying us, Lord, we lay that down at your feet this day. We acknowledge that uh, your kingdom on heaven is coming and breaking through here on earth, both here and coming, as we look at that imagery of you holding heavenly court. Lord, we acknowledge you as judge. You put right what is wrong. But we also acknowledge there are times, yes, and we fail and we don't honour you as we should and we ask for your forgiveness as we journey together. Lord, may our sacrifice be honouring you may it be a worthy sacrifice our lives our time our gifts and in our journey may we declare your faithfulness may we see it in our own lives yes but may we declare it to others in jesus name amen amen <laughs>
sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your reading is taken from 2 Corinthians 4 verses 2 to 6 and I'm reading from the New International Version. And even if our gospel is filed, it is filed to those who are perishing. The God of his, this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as our servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of his knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Good morning. The Gospel reading this morning is taken from Mark chapter 9 verses 2 to 9. After six days Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when he looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Thanks be to God.
So, reflecting on the account of the transfiguration here in Mark's Gospel. Those watching earlier in the week will have heard me share a few brief reflections working through the text. And one of the things that I've said is when you're looking at the scripture, try and think, what is it, what is it that the, uh, the compiler of the Gospel uh, is trying to tell you? So Mark here, what is it that Mark is looking to tell us as we step back and try and picture this wondrous event well yes we are aware that jesus is transfigured dazzling there's elijah there's moses but what's the point of the story the point of the story is here i believe a cloud overshadowed them and from the cloud there came a voice this is my son the beloved listen to him and suddenly when they looked around they saw no one with them anymore but only Jesus. So this is what Mark is trying to tell us. This is what everything else adds up to. And then we can take a step back and think, well, why are those different characters, those characters of old there, Elijah with Moses? Let's think about context. So Jesus is going up to a high mountain um, within Jewish thinking at the time. Uh, you know, The mountains were the places of encounter with the uh, divine and therefore it's just no surprise to us that we realize that at the mountaintop they have this experience uh, peter james and john are there they see jesus they see elijah and they see moses and these are two very significant figures elijah the greatest prophet known to the people of israel in many uh, jewish eye and moses the high priest uh, of uh, Israel and so therefore you have 
Jesus and these two other individuals of such weight that are giving a reassurance of the gravity of Jesus's ministry and yes that the truth that Jesus comes from God along with the dazzling white and we focus on the transformation yes but the point is that Elijah and Moses's presence underlines Jesus's significance it also speaks to me personally about well what they're talking about there must have had been some kind of conversation about the nature of Jesus' ministry, the, the divine plan as it unfolds as Jesus journeys towards the cross. So the important thing to remember here is that Mark is wanting us to take Jesus seriously. We recognise Jesus as God's son, the beloved, that we must listen to him. The second thing that's easy to miss is this reference to Elijah as they were coming down from the mountain he ordered them not to tell no one about what they'd seen until after the son of man had risen from the dead on its own it doesn't quite stand does it but let's just have a look further and in Mark chapter 9 they kept the matter to themselves questioning what this rising from the dead could mean then they asked him to the scribes say that Elijah must come first he said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. And so therefore, this reference to Elijah, we see this, this is an interjection here from uh, the Oremus Bible reading. It's their title, it's not in the original text. But the important thing is that the presence of Elijah is crucial as well, because it was taken that Elijah would herald in the Messiah. And if you remember to the account of uh, Jesus in Mark's Gospel equally asking the question of Peter who do they say that I am who do you say that I am and Peter says well you're the Messiah but before that we hear the rumours that Jesus is um, Elijah back uh, uh, or another prophet back from the dead and yes Jesus says but who do you say that I am and Peter says you are the Messiah and that's uh, significant because it would have been expected that Elijah would have made an appearance. And so as we read here in Mark chapter 9, yes, Elijah has made an, an appearance and uh, therefore God's people are able to look in anticipation towards the coming of Jesus. Uh, imagine, if you, if you just turn that on its head for a moment, as, as imagine um, how an early Christian might defend themselves um, if an Orthodox Jew would say, but hang on, you're saying this Jesus is the Messiah. Where is Elijah? Well, here he is in the Transfiguration. So that's why Mark is writing. Mark is writing uh, in this particular section to underline Jesus' identity as the Messiah. Let's just think for a moment about this process of transfiguration, whiter than white, changed beyond recognition, then seemingly uh, changed back again afterwards in what is a mountaintop experience. And a lot of our focus when we look at this passage starts there. It starts with, are we open to be transfigured, to be changed beyond recognition? And are we indeed open to the mountaintop experience? But beware, the mountaintop experience is one thing don't forget you've got to make your way back down the mountain again at this period in the history of the life of our churches and our circuits we are at least doing the right thing as we look to the future and are questioning god what is it that you want to do with us and we're open to transformation and we will we'll listen to each other we'll listen to what is said we will try and discern how God is encouraging each of us in our own lives and in our churches to be open, to be adaptable, to be open to the change that's required to receive the blessing that God has for us as the kingdom unfolds before us as we look to the future. But there's something of vulnerability in that. And I see this um, when I look at the transfiguration here. An encounter with God on the mountaintop, not quite saying that our circuit gathering is like the mountaintop experience but we'll do our best um, the mountaintop experiences and in ex ex experiencing the presence of God 
but also there being kind of a human vulnerability in that. And the vulnerability here, the kind of embarrassment I almost feel, is for Peter, in fact. Because Peter really doesn't seem to know what to do. In fact, it tells us that he didn't know what to say here. So Peter, seeing this scene with Elijah and Moses, says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. There's something in that. And the mountaintop experience, and as we gather, there is an element, as we're open to the presence of God, there is an element for being for being perhaps fearful and apprehensive, because whilst on the one hand we know that God has good things for us, on the other hand, we're slightly wary and feeling a bit insecure until we know a little bit more about, well, what exactly does that entail? I think Peter here is is not quite expecting this, perhaps. I'm not sure whether Jesus breathed the disciples, but nonetheless, there is a sort of certain vulnerability, human frailty in this, as Peter completely misreads the situation. And, you know, do you want us to set up tents for you and Elijah? I think I think there's something about that vulnerability. In, in order to receive the divine, we need to just be open and gracious with ourselves and kind to ourselves about the vulnerability. I, I wonder if people did have something to say, and perhaps that question came later. We read on that there's more to be said, that there's more dialogue uh, immediately after us. But maybe people did have something to say, but he struggled to articulate it in the right way. The good news is that he's not, he's not, he's not embarrassed, he's not called out by this. But sometimes as we're scratching around trying to make sense of life, we might be conscious of our vulnerabilities and what we say. Maybe a bit like going on a first date. I'm a great fan of um, the first dates kind of genre of television. I find it really uh, encouraging and, and uplifting because they never tend to end badly. But you always find in those first date encounters, we don't quite know what to say, that the stupid things just come out of our mouths and drop to the floor. And I want us to say that as as we talk about the future in the life of our circuit, let's accept our human vulnerability. Let's be open and gracious for each other. Let's be open. That we perhaps will say lots of things, but the God thing is there and is there to be found. But on the journey, we may well say some other stuff as we simply try and make sense of everything. Peter says to Jesus, you know, should we set up tents? There's no other reference to that. That's the... the um, apart from the fact that he was, you know, he, he just blundered and, and didn't really know what to say at all. Um, but as the story unfolds, we see that there's a richness and a depth to the dialogue that continues. And most of all, we're reminded that Jesus is God's son. You might be interested to know why Jesus, when he's coming down the mountain, urges disciples not to say anything to anyone about what they'd seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. I've spoken about this before. That's not because he's trying to hide things away. It's because Jesus is wanting control of how his identity is known and understood rather than it circulating too early. And then he'll be in a position, an arguable point, I admit, but then be in the position of trying to undo misapprehensions and understandings of his identity. So be kind to each other on the mountaintop. Expect things to happen on the mountaintop. When we gather, whether it's a circuit gathering or whether we gather for face-to-face -face worship, whether we gather in live stream, expect something to happen on the mountaintop and be gracious and kind to each other as we discern um, how God is moving among us. But as I look as, and, and see how the lectionary readings unfold, we jump next week to Mark 1, which makes me a little bit more confident to say something more about what follows this. So we've talked about the coming of Elijah here. Um, but as the gospel rolls on, we see this question about, well, what do the scriptures say about Elijah? As Mark um, presses the point home to his readers, you know, Elijah has come, therefore Jesus is the Messiah. Um, but this, the next element of the story, I do think, is worth some focus because it tells us that when they came to the disciples, once they'd left the mountaintop, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw him, they were immediately overcome with awe, it reads, and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? 
And someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down. And he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked the disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. And uh, he answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And then the story unfolds that the boy is brought to Jesus and Jesus delivers him. Now, laying aside how we might choose to interpret this passage today in terms of the boy's, the boy's ailment, I think the important thing to, to recognise is that we can have the mountaintop experience. And indeed, we might even reach the point where we're enthused or we, we reach a point of, of deeper understanding how God is calling us to work. But then we come down the mountain and then we enter into difficulty. This is not just your feet settling in reality. This is Jesus entering into difficulty and to challenge. But that challenge is also an opportunity uh, for Jesus. It's an opportunity, another opportunity to model a healing and to underline the importance of uh, his teaching. And there are three aspects of this story that really speak to me as we think about changing our own lives, changing our churches and change as we discern how God is calling our churches to work together. So the first is that Jesus encounters the other disciples and says, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Now, as I say, it's not to be recommended that leaders say that to their congregations, <laughs> let alone uh, the ministers. But I, I do want to uh, suggest that there are times when we feel that we have vision and we have faith and we're disappointed that we don't see it in others. And Jesus felt the same way as well. But we're all growing, number one. And number two... Um, that doesn't mean that God's uh, walked out and is, is not work. God's still at work in the midst of that situation. But there are times when we're trying to communicate and to encourage others. And, and we just sort of feel that people are faithless, blinded even, um, to quote the words of Paul writing to uh, Corinthians. So yes, don't give up. Don't give up, even though you perhaps don't see the faith and the vision in others that you would hope to see. Jesus then tells the disciples to bring the boy um, to him and asks for the man to give some details about how long the boy's suffering. And the man says, ask Jesus to have pity on him and to, to heal him. And Jesus says these words. These words may encourage you today. All things can be done for the one who believes. So here, and there are other passages, but here in this case, you know, belief is important that it's stirred but all things can be done for the one who believes so don't lose hope when you're looking for renewal in your own life renewal in your local church and renewal in the circuit and then the fine thing the final question comes from the disciples why could we not cast it out why could we not carry out this miracle and Jesus said this kind can only come out through prayer which is a reminder to me about the importance of prayer in our own lives and prayer in our churches. We may well talk the talk all the time about wanting to see God at work in our own lives, wanting to see God at work in our churches and our tra churches transfigured, wanting to see God at work in the life of our circuit. And whilst there's certain practical things that we need to be doing, ultimately the most important calling that we have is to call people to prayer. So be encouraged this day as we think about the transfiguration linked with those themes. So the transfiguration, uh, the whole point of that event being to underline Jesus's identity, the need that we need to listen to Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, we are open to our human frailty and it's more important to be vulnerable and to be open to God. But as we survey the scene, as perhaps we come down from the mountain, let's not to be too hard on ourselves or others when we don't see the faith in others that we like to see in the vision. Um, that will frustrate us and there's a, there's a place for that. Be careful about the judgments we make in that. But at the same time, know that 
those situations can turn around. The faithless generation can become faithful. Second thing, again, we remember that all things can be done for those who believes. All things can be done for the one who believes. And so perhaps in our conversations with others or if we're checking ourselves, we need to think and look at how God has been faithful in the past and to acknowledge that God will continue to be faithful in the future and to grow in our belief. But we also have to be open to the Spirit's working to stir our belief. And finally, at the core of all things, the core of all transfiguration is prayer. Is prayer. How did this miracle take place? How did Jesus do this? Jesus did it because of his focus on prayer. And whilst in the life of the in our own lives, in the life of our local churches, in the life of our circuit of churches, we can be focused on practical things we need to be doing. Absolutely. The most practical thing that we can do is be calling people to prayer. And then, then we create the platform from which people find belief and conviction that, yes, something different can happen. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, God's blessing be with us all. Amen. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, it's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am Free at last he Ransom, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child.
let's just have a quick look and these obviously are the prayers that were up on the Thursday but I'd encourage you if you are at home and not able to get to church I'd encourage you to take a look at the Methodist Church Twitter feed uh, you can see here God our creator some wonderful hands there perhaps that leads you in your prayers this morning uh, to think about the work that we do with children certainly celebrating messy church I'm looking forward to uh, messy church um, this uh, weekend and uh, perhaps thinking about children in our churches and we want to be praying there God is our uh, creator and uh, JPIT joint public issues team on Thursday was calling us or is calling us to pray for all asylum seekers and refugees perhaps that is a mute prayer for us this morning God you were born into displacement we pray that all displaced people find safety and security and are treated with humanity kindness and dignity amen amen i am going to jump to the prayer of the day and uh, george wither 16th to 17th century great O god is the power of your glory great are the wonders of your works and great is the wisdom of your justice and mercy and for all these we bless you and magnify your holy name now and forever amen and a prayer for jennifer heard O god our creator like the collier digging underground and the quarryman chiselling the face of the slate, you're at work to discover treasure in unexpected places. May we produce something beautiful for you, even from the darkness and the coldness, that we may bring glory to your name and for the sake of the coming of your kingdom. Amen. We've got coming up in our comments section, lots of amen. All right, we pray for those who are in pain, as pain has... Helen's got a pain relief injection today, so please pray it works longer than the last one. So we do pray for Helen, we pray for you if you're struggling this day. Um, Bonnie Longstaff's got glasses on now, reminded to myself that I need to go to the opticians. Um, but interesting to see and helpful to see those prayers there as we all journey together. Keep them coming through because we're going to conclude with the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to sign out now with my lighthouse. And... Um, before I go off and, and, as I say, visit somebody in hospital. So an early finish uh, for me. So let's say the Lord's Prayer. We're nearly through to the end, but I still invite you just to finish um, with those closing uh, lines. So, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen, folks. It's been lovely to join you today. Uh, please, please don't forget, and uh, as we listen to our uh, our concluding uh, song, uh, please do continue to pop those prayers uh, in, the, uh, in the prayer section as we continue to journey on uh, together. Uh, let's... Um, just having a look. Ooh, oh, where did I find it? I, I know that I've... I'm really getting a little bit sort of... I know that I selected my light. Oh, it is my lighthouse. Enjoy, folks, as we uh, sign out. Take care. Stay safe. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea.
carry me safe to shore.